welcome to Good Game. I'm Nick Boy. And I'm Hex. And tonight on the show, we experience what it's like to fight a war there in the trenches and then what it's like to live in the aftermath of one. So that should be fun, shouldn't it, Hex? Yeah, it's going to be crazy amounts of fun. First up, we check out the Battlefield 1 beta. Whoa, they're a tank, 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 tank. <laughs> Plus, we head back to the wasteland for the final piece of Fallout 4 DLC, Nuka World. What did you feel as you did it? When you brought that walking pile of human garbage to his knees? Bored. Kinda like this conversation now that you mention it. And Goose takes us on a tour of another local indie dev studio. And yep. wait until you get a good look at the custom controller they've built for this game. It's nuts. But until then, can you name the game for this week? With the shooter season rapidly approaching, it means we have entered the pre-shooter beta season, and one of the biggest shooters of the year recently had its open beta, the stupidly named Battlefield 1. Seriously, why call it Battlefield 1? It's like calling the new Jason Bourne movie Jason Bourne. It's not the first one. If you just wait till after the episode, I'll explain it. It's like I'm a viewer again. <laughs> oh my god, I can't believe I'm on a horse in a Battlefield game. It's I like can't Red believe Redemption. I've died oh six times gosh. already. I just want to run and jump. Oh! For the Turks! Yes! <laughs> <laughs> no. There's another one! Uh, there's another one! Dead! We're dead! Hex, I have... <laughs> yes! Get him! Get him! I can't drive! I can't drive! <laughs> Didn't see that one coming! <laughs> This is, of course, called Battlefield 1 because it's set during World War 1, which I think is one of the least explored wars in gaming history. Yeah, I'd say so, except uh, I can't remember a game about the Crimean War? Oh, yeah. Or the Boer War? Falklands War? No Falklands War game. Gamergate? Yeah, that one's still going. <laughs> and it's probably because World War I is one of the biggest and bloodiest wars in our history. It's filled with trench warfare and battles that were more horrible than heroic and, and trench foot hex. So these are things that most developers would go, we can't make a fun game about that, but not dice. Well, I think they've certainly taken more than a few liberties with the historical accuracy here to make it fun. Still feels a bit dirty calling World War One fun. Yeah, well, I guess if games can make every other war seem fun, then why not try it with World War One? But I am excited to see the swing away from the trend of modern and futuristic settings for games, and I'm interested to see how DICE handles such a tricky subject matter. Hmm, well, the setting has certainly given it a unique flavour. Seeing horses and biplanes and those big lumbering tanks all going at it is pretty much unlike any other shooter out there. But for all the changes a World War I setting could bring, this is still unmistakably a Battlefield game. Yeah, it's almost like a reskin in many ways, although a significant one. The beta gave us access to one map and two classic Battlefield modes. With the 64-player mayhem of Conquest, where two teams vie for control over various points on the map, we have taken objective to and Rush, a more structured 24-player affair where one team attacks and tries to arm points while the other team tries to defend them and dies. We have taken out objective button. Outside of those familiar modes, there are a few significant changes, and I suppose the biggest moment-to-moment -moment difference is the weapons. Going back to bolt-action rifles and slower, beefier styles of automatic weapons gives combat a slightly slower, more tactical feel, I thought. And the inclusion of gas grenades and gas masks adds an eerily bleak vibe to things, too. And I think you have to pay more attention to how your weapon works than with modern guns. Probably the biggest new thing are those special power weapons you can pick up on the map, such as the flamethrower or anti-tank, anti-plane sniper rifle. I feel like there was a more diverse range of vehicles this time around. Well, some of them are alive. There are a bunch of different types of tanks and planes to choose from, which all handle very differently and fill different roles. And of course, we can't forget those horses. I do love riding around on a horsey, though, Hex, even though it does leave you exposed. Oh, and it is awful when you have to shoot one, though. Mm. Something I do think will be contentious with Battlefield fans, though, is the way vehicles spawn. 
No longer are they sitting on the map waiting for the first person to grab them, but instead you need to select one from a checkpoint as you're deploying. On the left-hand side of the map? I'm in. Yeah. I'm in. I mean, it's a minor difference, but I always enjoyed spawning in and then rushing to a waiting vehicle. Yeah, I guess it's to stop players from just crowding around a spawn point, waiting for a vehicle to pop up. Yeah, but doesn't that mean players are just going to wait in the deploy screen now instead? Well, I didn't say it was a perfect system. <laughs> but the biggest change for me is you feel way more vulnerable on foot against these vehicles. Most soldiers don't have any anti-tank weapons, and those that do need to get in real close to use them. There are no bazookas or rocket launchers here. Yeah, I'd almost say the tanks are overpowered. Mm. A well-operated tank can pretty much control a game. You really need other tanks or one of those stationary guns to deal with them. There's still plenty of destruction, and it seems like tanks and artillery leave much more significant craters around the map. There's also a random weather system now, which can kick up a bit of dust or create an almost impossible to see through storm. And I like that it's random because it adds some unpredictability to things and makes it feel more natural. I like these special behemoth vehicles myself, which sort of rock up if your team is doing badly. So in this map, if you suck enough, the game goes, hey, Nick, here's a giant train loaded with guns. Let's see if that helps. It didn't though. But all in all, I feel like this is shaping up to be a unique and solid entry for the series. Yeah, and who knows, they might be able to pull a decent single player campaign out of this setting too. Yeah, I wouldn't get your hopes up. Now here's Goose with another indie dev profile. Keys please. That's the key. <laughs> I've never started a game with a key before. Okay, so turn, turn the key and then hit the on button. And... Yep. Cool. All right. Oh, we should leg it. Let's get out of here. <laughs> Flat Earth Games is run by siblings Lee and Alyssa Harris. Their latest game is a space sim, which can be played with a very unique, very cool piece of equipment. Excellent. So, see that little guy down there? I do. All hands on deck. Cool. Right. Can you lay it out for me? What exactly is this game? Objects in Space is an open world stealth space trading game. Mm -hmm. It's based on the idea that instead of piloting your spaceship like it was a plane, you're navigating it like it was a submarine. These ones here? Yeah. Oh, there we go. Oh, oh, easy, easy, easy. The green button down the bottom stops you from spinning. Got it, all right. So we are taking that direction. Yep. Talk me through what the process of developing this game and the interface that you've built with it was. I had been playing with electronics and I began to figure that I could probably hook it up so that there would be lights and things. And I, I initially did it just on my own on weekends and basically put some lights in a shoebox and then connected the, the, um, a few of them to that. Showed it to Lee, and as we got closer to our first expo showing, it kind of escalated a bit. <laughs> <laughs> it came together because Alyssa just suggested, hey, what if we built just like the shoebox, but really showed what we could do with like mm. big panels and everything in time for PAX. This was two or three weeks from PAX Australia oh, last year. <laughs> so uh, that involved uh, Jenny and Alyssa spending like nights constantly working on building and tinkering away and that sort of thing. We've been taking it to shows now for a year or more. The reason why we keep taking it to these shows is because when we first got people to do hands-on with it at Avcon in Adelaide, just watching people lose themselves and get engrossed in something that we were like, we were terrified might be a little bit too obtuse, but yeah. no. It's hugely encouraging because it was something where uh, when we started it, this is this is kind of a, in very broad terms, it's a game idea that we've wanted to play since we were um, very young, but it always seemed uh, way too big in scope to be mm. something that we would ever actually attempt. And it probably is too, too big in scope for something we should have attempted, but we <laughs> did it anyway. Is this your big piece of advice you would give to people? It's like stay naive or, or you know. Yeah, jump so in the deep end of the pool. Totally. <laughs> it's amazing what you can do. All systems on, no, off. How did the company first come about? I was kind of a happy accident. Previously, I was working writing about games. Mm -hmm. Before that, I was doing PR for Rockstar Games. I was doing software development, and then on the side, I was doing games writing. Mm -hmm. So that's where a lot of this started, was that I was sort of thinking about the theoretical side of it. But I'd never considered actually programming it myself since I was a kid. Like, yeah. we used to program little things together when we were young. Alyssa came up with a great idea for a game. She gave me a call and said, hey, do you want to come to this meeting and like make games together. And so from that uh, idea or that initial meeting, you guys moved into a full indie studio. When did it go through that stage where you realized, hang on, this is who we are now? For Towncraft, the game was successful enough that 
it allowed uh, Alyssa to go full time. Mm -hmm. I'm still part time, as is everyone else who helps out with our projects. I think that's fairly sort of standard that people uh, doing the indie side of things are doing a few things at once. But uh, we've been able to sustain that through our second release, which was Metricide, mm -hmm. and through Super Death Fortress, and more recently uh, as publishers for Unstoppable, and now into Objects in Space. Reconnect, it. reconnect and. We have three. <laughs> that felt coming so, back again. That felt so satisfying. Like I could never do anything like that in real life. I would have dropped the screws somewhere, and I'd be like sweating in the engineering room. But here, I'm a pro. What is it about our studio that's unique? It was our love of '90s games. Yeah. So we were just sort of pitching it as it's a, a studio making games for today that are heavily influenced by a very particular period of like golden age of PC gaming. Indie seems to be what Australia is very good at at the mm. moment. There's a lot of talent floating around and there's a lot of people who are really good at making games on a small scale. What's the outlook for Flat Earth in terms of the next five or so years? What are you guys hoping to achieve as a, as a, as a studio but also as a business? Still be making games? Yeah. Sure, yes. <laughs> I think like it's one of those things where survival and success start to look awfully similar yeah. when you're doing indie stuff. Like, we don't we don't need to you know make millions and make the next crossy road or anything like that. We just want to be able to keep on making original stuff that we enjoy. Okay, well we are back at the Good Game Roundtable. I've got Goose and Nick with me, and we are going to talk remasters today because we've had a crazy amount of remasters recently. We've got Bioshock. Yep. It's just coming out. Um, Resident Evil Four, the Dead Rising series. There's a lot of them. What's going on? I think at this stage there's a lot of sequels coming out later down the line, at least with Dead Rising and with Resident Evil, mm. and so it's a great way to get people interested in the franchise again. I'm, I know I'm going to play Dead Rising and go, I can't wait for the next one. Mm. I'm thrilled because a lot of these games I don't own on consoles or computers that I have now. I didn't buy a lot of these on PC, so something like Bioshock, which I consider to be one of the greatest video games of all time, thrilled about that collection because I actually get to have it on something, I um, get it on PC, now I can keep it forever as opposed to get it on 360 and I don't I don't really have the way to play that anymore because I don't have a 360 anymore. Do you think you're going to play through all three games though? Generally, I'm not someone who likes to replay story games. Sure. I'm, one, I'm kind of one and done with them, but uh, there are exceptions for this. Uh, I tend to not dip too much with the uh, with the remasters, but uh, the Nathan Drake collection and Bioshock are the two that I just go, had yeah. to do. I yeah. was about to say, I'm not one to replay games either, except the Nathan Drake collection came out and I started again with the first Uncharted. Mm. And oh my gosh, uh, for starters, it's so wonderful to see how far we've come. Yeah. And to be able to play through the series, even the way it's been remastered, obviously it's been improved a little bit, but there's still some noticeable differences in the way the game looks and the way the game plays. And it's really exciting to kind of see that evolution throughout the series. There's definitely a timeline where I think you can't go any further back than a certain point, or if you remaster something from here, it's going to still look and play as shonky as it did back in the day. And I think, yeah. fortunately, something like that first Uncharted was right on the cusp, mm. because I'd never played that one. I'd played two and three, and so I, this was a great chance for me to jump in and finally play the first oh, one. Oh man, like the whole Elena origin oh, kind of, of that romance. Suddenly everything made sense. Mm. Well, I guess it kind of takes us to a, a point of what really makes a remaster versus a remake, because mm. if you were to, um, you know, refresh the first Assassin's Creed, I would want that remade. Yeah. You know, I think the control Controls and everything would need to be updated. I'd, I'd want more interesting quests, but I'd still want that game to kind of fit into the rest of the series as the origin story for that series. But when you talk about remaking, you're only talking, I guess, about adding just those features that we take for granted little now. Little tweaks, yeah. yeah. Lots and lots and lots of little tweaks, so the game feels like a current-gen version of an Assassin's Creed game. Yeah, totally. You're not going to go in there and change story or move things around and, and really remake it. It's no, just going to no, be that. No. Yeah. I think, you know, when you talk about a remaster, it's, it's definitely updating the visuals and maybe some of the controls, I think, with the Nathan Drake collection, they changed his ability to latch onto things yeah. and a bit of his movement. They sure. made a lot of that more fluid, which is something that we, you know, the, the platforming and his movement through the game, which is really important. Yeah. I think for me, when it comes to what makes me pick up a remaster, it's I, I want to recapture the feeling I had when I played that game in the first place. Mm. So for me, the best remasters are ones that make me think that this is how the game was all along. Right. Where yeah. it's like, oh, this is how it looked the whole time, or this is how it played, and the, the, those little tweaks where you just go, oh yeah, this is my memory. This yeah. is my memory of this, and and it becomes a showcase. So, so you want the updates to be subtle enough that you feel like it was that way all along? Which is why we're talking about the back button where you see the old graphics or whatever. Yeah. That's when you yeah. go, oh right, of course it didn't actually look like this, but this is actually what time and my 
my memory and, you know, alcohol has done. You hold a lot of that stuff with a certain air of romanticism totally. in, in your mind, but when you have to sit down and play something for five, six, ten hours, yeah. you don't want to be, like, stuffing around with awkward controls and poor hit detection. I guess like often that. I'll just end up playing the first ten minutes of all these remasters and go, <laughs> ah, those were the days, and I'm done. <laughs> and I feel like there is the issue, though, that, that a lot of these games, they're being done by... B teams mm. within the studio, or they farm it out to one of these companies that just do ports and remasters, uh, and they're not the ones who originally made the game. And and that that that's that thing where if it feels careless, like the um the Marvel Ultimate Alliance came out recently, looks terrible. It's a ten year old game, looks awful. But also, all like it had a bunch of DLC originally with the game, and that's not included on the disc. Right. So this remaster is missing characters that was the DLC, and that's where you go, why? Like you didn't you didn't try at all. I think it makes sense to have the B team. On it though, you want your best people working on the new stuff, and essentially, kind of releasing a remaster isn't. I don't think it's as big a cash grab as we think it could potentially sure. be. I think it's a way. You know, there's there's a lot of games that I probably wouldn't go back and play, but if they remastered it, I'd think twice. Yeah, How yeah. much time has to pass before you consider re remastering something? I mean, well, has enough time been since Bioshock? I, it feels like not for me. No, no, because Bioshock is so old. Like, Bioshock is actually, like, quite Am I just old. forgetting how much time has maybe, passed? Maybe, maybe. You've I been think... in a fugue state. It's actually... <laughs> <laughs> well, what about, I mean, there's the Skyrim remaster, which is coming out. That's been, what, five oh, years? Oh, yeah. Is that long enough? Let that game die. <laughs> just <laughs> stop, stop. Let I Bethesda mean... make good new games. Sometimes it's just the collection of these games. Like in the case of Bioshock, mm. I think it's, it has been too soon since the most recent game, but give me all three of those games. Oh, you games. just want it on your shelf. You I don't just, play games at all. No, I just like to have them on a shelf. <laughs> I, I get a real sense of satisfaction. I have played those games in the past, and like, with the Dead Rising games. Especially when they package it with some little leather exactly. box thing around I it. I want it in this beautiful little collector's yeah. edition. I'm going to put it there, and I know that I can go back to when it When they make it look like some kind of classy, like, library book collection. And you can sort of slide it in and say, board. I have read those books, or I've played those games. Mm. You're like, your game Dexter. Like, yeah, you just exactly. have this collection. <laughs> <laughs> the problem is, that will only last until the next generation comes out, and then they bring out the even, you know, and, more fancy version. And that's why, and obviously this can't be an argument for everybody because you need a decent rig, but getting this stuff on PC is probably the best idea because it stays playable. It doesn't mm. really matter how old mm. it gets. Every time you change consoles, if they're not going to enable really strong backwards compatibility, then mm. that that's why a lot of this stuff comes out each time. And I love bringing these old games back as long as the care is put in. I think that's the thing, right? Like, if you feel as though publishers and the devs care as much about the game as you do, then it's an investment in something cool and not just a cash grab. Yeah, well, I mean, I think, like it or not, remasters have become quite a significant part of the release schedule for a year. People really expect them. And I think maybe that's more so now because we're still in the early stages of a new console generation, so mm. it feels like maybe it's more justified. I mean, we are seeing so many games where they're making sequels or they're revisiting them to make the next sequel. Mm. It means that they're going to go back and they're going to jazz up those old games again, and I think it's kind of exciting. As they should. That should be a punishment for bringing back an old series. You yeah. have to bring back the best version. If you of can't them. move on, yeah, you've got to go back. And, and if you can't beat the remaster with your new game, maybe don't do it in the first place. Yeah. Well, I think we can all agree that remasters can be great if they're done well. Uh, what do you think of remasters? Are they good? Good, bad, bit of a cash grab, let us know online. Are you gonna buy COD? Don't buy COD. You're gonna buy it. You're pathetic. I'm pathetic too, it's fine, we're all pathetic. Hex, describe Fallout 4 for me in three words. Uh, sprawling, lonely, and fatiguing. How about you? Ambitious, repetitive, exciting, unfinishable. Well, that was four words. Yes, much like Fallout 4, I tried to cram too much in there. Oh! Snap. Yes, this is Fallout 4 Nuka World. I have a little tip to help you make the most of your exciting Nuka World adventure. Where should I go? Get the hell out of my face! I will wear your bones. Kill them! I'll be back before sundown. I appreciate it. From deep down you raiders are all the same. They don't like the way we play. We're a rough root to the trio. Lovely family. Zito like She's new friends. Nuka World is Fallout 4's final piece of DLC, and it's a big story one. I wanted to get some help and go back with them. 
that didn't count on taking a bullet. That's what trust gets you out here in the Commonwealth. The expansion starts when you meet Harvey, a dying stranger asking for your help to save his family from a group of raiders who have taken over the Nuka World theme park. But Harvey's a goddamn liar. Harvey bagged another sucker to help his family. And he was just the bait to lure you into running a nightmarish gauntlet of death while raiders look on like kids at Disneyland. We got ourselves some fresh meat to run the gauntlet. Thankfully though, someone is on your side. Gage, a raider with a surly attitude and an incredibly uncomfortable looking eye patch. This operation needs someone to step in and take the reins. Who helps you survive the gauntlet, defeat the boss with the help of a water pistol, and then just like that, you become king of Nuka World. Which seems like a terrible way to promote someone. I mean, Total Stranger comes in and kills the current boss, so they become the new boss? Yes, it's how I got the job here. But my first act as boss was to make sure Harvey got what was coming to him. He's a devil. <gasps> He's a dog. Why is he naked? Traitors die naked, Hex. It's the rule of the dictatorship. He's a dog. And the problem you as leader now face is that within Nuka World, there are sections that still aren't raider occupied, which is surprising because there are no less than three separate raider gangs in the park, so you'll need to convince them you're the person for the job. Although again, why they listen to you, a total stranger dressed as an astronaut, is beyond me. Well, I'll be damned. You actually did it. Hey. Show a little respect. Why did you suggest it to me when you said that? Because I feel like out of the two of us, I command more respect in an astronaut outfit. Oh, really? Yeah. I guess I could bring a little law and order to these parts, Sheriff. It's because I'm short, isn't it? You know, apparently astronauts do better because when, when they're smaller. Mm. Because they've got to fit into tight spaces and stuff. But this game is set on Earth. Well, the gangs are all quite distinct. <laughs> Watch yourself, boss. The Disciples are pretty standard raiders, psychopaths who decorate mainly with scrap metal and corpses. Everyone knows we all wanted Coulter dead. Of course, if I had my way, it would have been a slow, painful process. The operators are all about earning those caps and making sure their hair is on fleek. That man was an idiot. It is all look bad. I guess we can take some solace in the fact that someone finally gave him what he deserved. And the PAX rule is there are no rules, except for the one rule, which is you must dress like an underfunded off-off Broadway rendition of The Lion King. You gonna be a problem, I know. Slow down there, boss lady. And since this is a Fallout game, you are eventually gonna have to side with one of those gangs. Yes, but I loved the look of the pack. It's just a shame their leader was such a douchebag. Gage says you're the boss now, so you're the boss. Luckily, I barely heard anything he said because a bug in the game meant whenever you talked to him, he got drowned out by a pit-fighting gorilla. Even though the gorilla ignored my pleas for silence. Oh. What? It didn't ask for that life. You're a murderer. Hey, take it up with the pack. <laughs> After you meet the gangs, Gage tells you the park is broken up into six sections. The gang's hub area, complete with a new hideout for you and a marketplace to stock up for the upcoming battles. What have you got? The medicine you need to set yourself free. And then five more zones for you to clear out and put under raider control. Are you feeling lost? Pathetic. Something I've never liked about Fallout is the palette. Oh, it's brown. Well-known fact, I hate brown games. It's so drab and monotonous. I know the planet was pretty much completely annihilated, but just put a lick of paint here and there. It's been 200 years. So when I heard that Nuka World was set in a theme park, you know, I was excited for some not brown. Yeah, and the areas do all have their own look to them. Join us on a journey into the future. Galactic Zone is a space-themed futuristic area. Approach and I Dry Rock Gulch is the Old West with robot sheriffs. Rustle up some horses for you, huh, cowboy? Giddy up, buttercup. Safari Adventure is the zoo section of Nuka World. Kitty Kingdom features a medieval castle, and World of Refreshment is, well, it's pretty much just a Nuka Cola bottling plant. But in late 2044, Nuka Cola was born. The problem I have with a lot of these zones is they're just so surface level. There's nothing here that requires this expansion to be set in a theme park. Beyond the name. Because if you meant Nuka World. Right. Mm. The enemies are almost all just ghouls or robots, baddies we've seen elsewhere. There's Nuka World stuff everywhere, but it's just decoration. 
the quests and gameplay would work just as well anywhere else in the world. Well, I don't think that's entirely fair. I mean, what about Kitty Kingdom? It had this great fun house that played with perspective. There was this spinning room of doors with booby traps behind each one and a hall of mirrors. And the storyline there about an abandoned theatre was pretty interesting. And what started out as a cliched horror trope ended up being something rather tragic. 200 years pass. What makes you think I can't wait 200 more? I just, I love it when Fallout makes everything seem black and white, but then they inject a whole lot of grey into the situation. And then that quest line has pathos. I just, you know, more of that would have been so great. Well, arguably, there is a lot of moral questionability here in this, because if you're going to play this expansion, you're gonna have to become a Raider shithead. And actually, when I realised this is where it was headed, I texted you because I couldn't <laughs> remember if you played a good guy or a bad guy in Fallout 4, and your answer was, Always good, I never murder. In every single game, always, I want everyone to be friends forever. So how did this sit with you? Yeah, not great. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it was fine when I was just killing robots who were trying to murder me. I don't want to hurt people. I can't change the fact that you're going to have to run some people out of their homes so we can give them to the gangs. But you're right, eventually you do have to go out into the Commonwealth and start taking over settlements and killing innocents. I mean, you do have the option to bribe them to leave peacefully. Take these caps and go. Where are they gonna go, Nick? They're just gonna die in the wasteland now because of me. I'm a murderer. Yes, you are. <laughs> a tiny murderous astronaut. But it is strange that Fallout 4 lets you play the game in one way, like you, playing as a good guy, and then with this expansion, you're forced to become the thing you hated all game. Yeah, and like not even in an interesting way. It's not like these guys are just doing this because they don't know any better or because they're fighting to protect something they believe in. They're just dicks. So, which gang should I have join you once you've staked your claim? The Disciples. Yeah? <laughs> Better bring a tarp. There's no subtlety at all. They're just constantly talking about wanting to kill people. Yeah, I think it's the problem that Fallout always has, right? It's the illusion of choice. The whole game feels like you're weaving your own story, but you reach these points where you realise, no matter what, you were always going to end up here. I already took everyone their orders. And I know that seems like nitpicking in a game that's so big and you can do so much in it, but if you spend 100 hours with a character, the choices you make and the moral code you give them, to me, that actually means something. Yeah, I mean, there's lots to do in Nuka World, but it's also nothing you haven't already experienced in previous Fallout adventures. I'm giving it three stars. Yeah, this is Fallout 4's final piece of DLC, and it's just a shame the note I'm going out on is one where I became the bad guy. I'm giving it two and a half. Although, you know, at almost any point within it, you can just kill all the raiders in the park and the DLC ends, so you don't actually need to go raid all those settlements and stuff. No! Yeah. Why didn't you tell me that before? Because sometimes I just want to watch a tiny murderous astronaut burn. I know you mean that as an insult, but I think tiny murderous astronaut is kind of badass. I wear it as a badge of pride. So, did you name the game for this week? What could it be? It was The Elder Scrolls III Morrowind. Set on the island of Vardenfell, you are free to quest, loot, explore and hunt to your heart's content. Don't stand about, get moving. Taking in the epic, freeform nature of this sprawling RPG. I mean, there was a main quest line, but, you know, you don't want to rush these things. And it was unnamed the game because it was developed by Bethesda Game Studios, the same folk behind this week's Nuka World. Next week on the show, what do we have next week, Hex? Uh, well, uh, Bajo will be back. In fact, the whole Good Game team are coming together to celebrate the show's 10 years on the ABC. It's going to be a one-hour 10th birthday special. We'll have special guests, live performances, discussion, laughs, and we'll revisit some memories. Hello and welcome to the very first Good Game. And all in front of a live studio audience. Yes, I suppose I'll have to give Bajo his chair back. Mm. Until next time, may all your games be good ones. Hex out. Nick Boy out. You know, if you just stole the chair, then that would give us grounds to finally get new ones because, you know, we don't have the budget for that. Yeah, and I do think they need... You need new chairs because these at least need a reupholster. Mm, they're a bit crummy. Yeah, it's all thumb action it's here from, from all budget, the edge-of-your-seat moments that you have while yeah. gaming. Yeah, right. It's like graphics. Graphics.